So James chapter 2, um, you know, this common and popular used phrase, you know, faith without works is dead. And, you know, what do they try and make James 2 mean? Well, they say, you know, well, faith without works is dead. So one thing they might try and say is, you know, well, faith and works are inseparable. So that's why, you know, if you have the faith, you're going to have the works because they always come hand in hand. And that's why the Bible says faith without works is dead, because if you don't have works, then you don't really have faith. Well, how does that even make sense with James? Because if James chapter 2, if we just uh, read one of them quickly, uh, it says here, verse 17, Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Now, if faith and works always come hand in hand, how can that statement even make sense? Because how, how, how is a dead faith e even possible? Because if it says, you know, faith without works is dead, but if you have faith, you always have works, then, then how is this dead even possible? So that doesn't make sense if faith and works are inseparable. So instead they might say, well, there's actually two types of faith. And they say, well, then there's a, a dead faith uh, or, or the fact or they might say you have no faith, or a dead faith, a faith that has no works. And then there's this saving faith, a faith that has works. Um, and then they basically define it as two types of, of faith. And they might say something like, you're not saved by works, but you're saved by faith that works. Now that doesn't help somebody that is trying to determine whether or not they have faith, because it just pushes the problem one step further away. You know, it's like in, in, in any business, they say you're kicking the can further down the road. So, because if we're trying to determine whether or not we have faith, but the only way, you know, or we're trying to determine whether or not we believe, and you determine whether or not you believe by whether you have faith, but then you're trying to determine whether you have faith by whether you have works, I mean, now you're just back to square one where you're trying to see whether I have enough works and we all come short. We've all offended in one point. We're all guilty of all. It's not really going to help us when we're trying to determine whether or not we're saved. And this is why it's one, a bad way of determining whether we are saved. Now, why does this, um, this interpretation of James 2 not fit what we see in the Bible in terms of, you know, you have a, a faith, one type of faith without works that does not save and then having one, another type of faith that does have works, that does save. Um, well, let's look at this uh, passage in Romans 4. Because it doesn't actually fit with what we see in Romans 4. Uh, let's read from verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So we see here a passage where somebody, it's a faith that doesn't have works. It's a faith where if you work not, but believe on him that justifieth the ungodly, your faith is counted for righteousness. And we see here that David describes the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So if we take the interpretation of James to say, well, there's a dead faith that doesn't save, that doesn't have works, and there's a faith that has works, and that's the faith that saves, well, how does that line up with Romans 4, where Romans 4 is telling us that there is a type of faith that doesn't have works, and this is the faith that saves? So if that's the faith that saves, that means a dead faith can save you because it's faith on Jesus Christ. That's what counts for righteousness. So it doesn't fit with uh, Romans 4. And just going back, you know, I, I want you to, to sort of keep in the back of your mind as we go through these verses. If, if somebody's going to use these verses to try and prove that they have faith or prove that they have salvation, every time you read these verses, you need to ask yourself, well, how much works do I need in order for that, con that condition that I've set by this verse to apply to me? Because let's say, for example, you believe that faith without works is dead, and dead meaning, um, well, they, they'll say dead meaning you don't have salvation. So we've showed in Romans 4 that you can believe and not have works, but you have salvation. So dead can't mean you can't have salvation. But also, faith without works is dead, meaning I don't have salvation if my faith doesn't have works. Isn't the next logical question, well, how much works do I need to have to have this saving faith? Because am I just going to set an arbitrary bar and say, well, I've got this amount of works, therefore my faith is living, 
Therefore, my faith is saving and I am saved. But where did you get this standard from? Where did you get this standard of this arbitrary level of works in order to determine that your faith was alive, that your faith was saving in order for you to then have salvation? So what then does this uh, dead faith mean? So well, let's go back to James 2 and let's just go through it really quickly. And we'll get an understanding of what it actually means. And you'll see that it's it, it, just throughout that whole scripture passage from 14 to the end, it's talking about faith in the eyes of, of man, how man can see your faith. Verse 14, what doth it profit, my brethren? So what benefit is there? Like, you know, a profit in a business is when your you know, income exceeds your expenses. So you make a gain. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, two things to note in that verse is it's a question. It's not a statement. So it doesn't say faith, this faith does not save him. It's just asking, can faith save him? So we could answer that question with, well, yes. You know, even if he has faith and has, doesn't have works, can faith save him? Yes. Um, I mean, two ways to think about this verse as well is, is it talking about spiritual saving or is it talking about physical saving? Because you can interpret it both ways. You know, can faith save him spiritually? Well, yes. But can faith save him physically? Well, maybe not. And it could possibly mean that more so than saving him spiritually. Why? Because as we read on, you'll see. So it says, what gain is it? The man say he hath faith and hath not works, can faith save him? Spiritually, of course, Romans 4 says, if he believes and has no works, his faith is counted for righteousness. But it could mean, you know, can faith save him physically? Meaning, can it profit him at all in the physical sense? Well, maybe not. Because if we read in verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food. So we see here, now the context is this physical uh, food and keeping yourself alive. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding ye give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So again we see the, 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 the physical aspect, but not only that, this verse is saying if somebody is hungry and you don't give them any food, what does, how is your faith going to benefit them at all? So we see still this, the direction of which we're showing this faith. It's still between man and man, isn't it? Because it's saying, what, how does your faith profit this other man if you say, depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body. So it's not saying, does it profit you in that sense? It's saying, what does it profit that other person, that other man? And it's not even talking about showing your faith to God. Even so... If it hath not work, oh, faith, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Now note, it says here, even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. So what is dead in that scripture? Well, it's the faith, isn't it? It's not the Christian. It's not the Christian that's dead. It's the faith that is dead. Because a believer can have a dead faith and still be saved. It's just not going to profit anybody. So it's the faith that is dead. I know some people will say, well, you know, if your faith doesn't have works, then you don't really have faith. But that doesn't even make sense in the analogy of faith without works is dead because just because something is dead doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You know, I could have a dead dog on the ground, but does that mean that that dog doesn't exist? Um, dead, I think here means... It doesn't, it, it doesn't profit anything. It doesn't bring forth any life. And I can, I can show you a passage in the Bible where it actually uses this word dead to, to mean that. Uh, let me show you here in uh, Romans 4.19. And this is still talking about Abraham. I just want to touch on here and we'll come back to Romans 4. But look at this verse in verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. So Abraham wasn't dead in the sense that he, he didn't have any life. He, he wasn't alive. It's saying that his body was not able to bring forth any life. And, and also Sarah, her womb, because she was barren, the Bible describes it as the deadness of of Sarah's womb. So something being dead doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means it, it, it can't bring forth life. 
It, it's dead. It doesn't have any life and it's not going to, to profit anybody. So that's one way we can think of, of, of dead. Verse 18, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So, you know, there are two, a couple of ways you can interpret that verse. You can say that, well, it's not really James saying that he's going to show people his, his works by his faith. Um, it's just somebody might say that. Um, I personally think that you do show other people your faith by your works because that's the only way you can show them your faith is by your works. So even if it's not James saying that, the principle is still there that, you know, somebody might have faith and have works, but we ought to show our faith to them by our works. And we'll see that principle in Titus a bit later on. So there's nothing wrong with that passage there to say, yeah, well, that's how we do show our faith to other people. But it's still not talking about salvation. It's still not talking about showing your faith to God. It's still a side words evidence of one man to another. This is how you show your faith to somebody else. You show it by works because they can't see your faith. Um, verse 19, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Now this is another verse where people will say, look, see, even the devils believe. So you can believe, but if you don't have works, I mean, you just have the sort of faith that devils have, and they're not saved. Therefore, how can you be saved if you just believe and you act like a devil or you act like um, you, you do the works of a devil? Um, well, first of all, this, is not, this is verse is not saying that, we, that, the, that they believe on Jesus Christ, which is what it takes to be saved. It just says, thou believest that there is one God. Now, the Muslims believe that there is one God, but they're not saved, are they? So you can believe that there's one God and not be saved. But even if this is talking about having faith on the Lord Jesus Christ, and part of that is believing that there's one God, and it says, Thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. If we read that verse in the context of what the whole chapter is talking about, which is being profitable to other people, it's still saying, well, even if you believe, if you act like a devil, I mean, it's not going to help anybody else. But not only that, is, you know, Jesus Christ, he did not even die for devils. You know, he did not die in the likeness of devils. So even if devils did believe on Jesus Christ, they couldn't be saved anyway. So there's a lot of ways that you can, you can interpret that verse and not to mean that you need to have works in order to have faith. So they believe that there is one God. Thou doest well, the devils also believe and tremble. But they're not believing on Jesus Christ, they're just believing that there's one God. Verse 20, But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? So he just re reiterates that truth, that faith without works is dead. And we believe faith without works is dead, because if you have a faith and you don't have works, your faith is dead. We need a living faith in order to be profitable to other people. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou? So I've already noted this to you guys before, but again you see the, the fact that other men are seeing your faith. He says, seest thou how faith wrought with his works? So you saw Abraham's faith when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. That's what that's saying there. So when, I, when Abraham offered Isaac his son upon the altar, seest thou, you saw his faith. He, you, thou seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Ye see then, so again, you seeing the faith of Abraham, Ye see then how that works, that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works, when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So I sort of alluded to that already, where you, know, you can have a body without a spirit, it's dead, but it doesn't mean the body doesn't exist. The body is there, and in this, I guess in this... Um, analogy, the body being the faith and the spirit being works, well, even if faith doesn't have works, faith still it can exist. It's just dead, just like a body without the spirit is dead. Now, let's just go back to verse 24. It says here, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Because somebody might take that verse and say, whoa, hey, look, justification, right? Well, it, we have to have works with our faith 
because that's how we're saved. That's how we get justified. Well, is that what verse 24 is talking about? No, because verse 24 in this whole context is talking about your faith profiting other men. So what does it mean here when it says your works, you're justified by works and not by faith only? I believe it's that your faith is made evident. It's justified in the eyes of man by works, which is the context that we see in this whole passage. Now let's just jump to Romans 4 and just compare it with what we see here because this really is the parallel passage to show you that James 2 is talking about your faith in the eyes of other men but Romans 4 talks about your faith in the eyes of God and we can prove this with the example of Abraham which is the common example between the two chapters. Let's read from verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. So he's justified by works in the eyes of man. You see, because it's saying here, if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory. So who is he glorying before? Before man, right? Because it says, but not before God. So he doesn't glory before God by his works. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness, even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now look at this. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? So it's saying, uh, is this blessedness that the Bible is talking about, is it only unto those that are circumcised or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So it's saying this blessing came on them not because they got circumcised, but they got this blessing when they were not circumcised. Uh, sorry, did I skip something there? Come at this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also, verse 9. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So what is this verse saying here in Romans 4? It's saying here that Abraham, which is the common example between James 2 and Romans 4, he was not justified in circumcision, meaning he wasn't justified and saved after he was circumcised. He was actually saved prior to when he was circumcised. So if we actually look into Genesis, we can actually see when Abraham was, I guess, in this sense, justified before circumcision. Because remember, if we go just quickly back to James 2, we read here in verse 21, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? So James 2 is saying there, well, he was justified when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. But Romans 4 is saying he's justified prior to when he was circumcised. So these are two different timescales here. And we, if we look in Genesis, we can actually prove that James 2 is talking about faith in the eyes of man. And Romans 4 is talking about faith in the eyes of God. Because we can prove here that... Abraham was justified many years before uh, he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. Look here, in Genesis chapter 12, we see here when um, Abraham was initially called out um, of uh, the land of the Chaldeans into the land of Canaan. Uh, in verse 12 here, let's just read, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. 
And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, if we read in Galatians, this is actually a shadow of the gospel, the blessing of Abraham coming on to him by faith. And it says here, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him, and Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So in Genesis 12, we see Abraham is 75 years old, and that's when he's called to leave his land and go into a land that God will show him. Now Genesis 15 is where we see this passage that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. So verse 15, After these things the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? <clears throat> and Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So this is the event that both James and Romans refer to when it says Abraham believed God and it was counted him for righteousness. It was a promise from God saying, you know, you will bear a son, and that's the son that will be, um, you know, the, the heir that will, will receive the blessing. So... Did Abraham get saved in Genesis 12 when he called upon the Lord and he was called out? Or did he get saved here in Genesis 15 when he believed God and it was counted him for righteousness? You know, maybe you can make a stronger case that this is when he got saved. If, if, if Romans 4 is saying that's when he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Um, but, you know, he could, he could have got saved in Genesis 12, you know, when he called upon the Lord. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the Lord shall be saved. But either way, that's not going to matter in a second. So Genesis 12, he's called, he's calls upon the Lord and he's called out of uh, the land of Haran and he, uh, he's 75 years old. We see here in Genesis 15, the account of when he's given the promise from God and he believes on God and it's counted for him for righteousness. The next chapter over, we see here in Genesis 16, I'm not just, I'm not going to read it all for the sake of time, but Genesis 16 is when Sarah says to Abraham, or maybe it, the way we're going to have children is if, you know, you sleep with my servant Hagar, and then Hagar will give birth, and then that will be, you know, how God will um, bless our seed. And then there's that whole story about, um, you know, what he does there. But I just wanted to show you in, in um, chapter 16, the age of Abraham when this happens. So, and Hagar bare Abraham a son, and Abraham called his son's name, which, bear, which Hagar bare Ishmael. And Abraham was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. So we know then that, you know, that Abraham was at least 86 years old when he was saved. Because he got saved prior to when he was 86 years old, because 86 years old is when uh, Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. But remember, he called upon the Lord in Genesis 12, you know, way before it's, it, it, when he was 75. So did he get saved there? Even if you say he didn't, got, get, didn't get saved there, well, in Genesis 15, when God gave him the promise and then he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, he, was, he had not reached 86 years old yet because it was Genesis 16 that then Sarah takes things into her own hands, gets Abraham to sleep with Hagar, and then Ishmael is born. He's 86 years old. Well, let's look at Genesis 17. Genesis 17, it says here, And when Abraham was 90 years old and nine. So how old is Abraham now? He's 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham but, uh, Abraham, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. 
Now let's just go on um, just to get to the um, covenant. Verse 10. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and, your, and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house, or bought with money, or of any stranger which is not of thy seed. So I won't read it all for sake of time, but Genesis 17 is then when we read about the covenant that God makes with Abraham of circumcision. Now, remember in Romans 4, we read that Abraham was already saved in uncircumcision. So he's 99 when he's given the covenant of circumcision, but he was saved many years before that. In fact, at least, you know, what's 86 minus 99 minus 86? At least 13 years, because Ishmael was circumcised when he was 13 years old. Abraham was 99 years old, we read later on, when, when he was circumcised. So at least 13 years, Abraham has been saved. Maybe even longer, if you go back to when he was 75, when he called upon the Lord and he was uh, called out of the land of the Chaldeans. So at least 13 years have passed, Abraham has been saved. Now he's given the covenant. Genesis 21 Oh, I won't turn there, but Genesis 21, we see Isaac being born. Abraham is 100 years old. We'll just go there quickly so you can see that. Genesis 21, and Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. And then, not only till we get to Genesis 22, where it says, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here am I, or, here, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the, in the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and saw the place afar off, and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and will again, uh, and will come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. So think about this. This proves that James 2 is not talking about salvation by works or being justified by works because Abraham in James 2 was justified by works when he had offered his son Isaac upon the altar. But he offered his son Isaac upon the altar at least you know, 13 years after he believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. At least 13 years. But it would be more than that because when he offers Isaac his son upon the altar, how old is Isaac? Because remember, he was 100 years old when Isaac was born. But Isaac here is talking to Abraham. You know, having a he, he's being able to reason with Abraham to say, hey, you know, we're going to give this offering, but, you know, where's the lamb? I mean, somebody that's Simon's age, you know, four or five years old, may not, even, may not understand that yet. But not only that, they're climbing up this mountain and Isaac is carrying wood on his back. I mean, I'm sure even Kevin's kids, they're pretty, pretty strong. But if you were to put wood on their back and climb up a mountain, they're not going to last very long. Um, so Isaac, I would say, I mean, he's at least, you know, a young teenager, I'd say. You know, but let's, let's be generous. Let's say he's 10 years old. But it's at least 23 years after Abraham believed God and was counted to him for righteousness in Romans 4, that he's justified by works in James 2 when he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. So you can see here that James 2 has absolutely nothing to do with your salvation. It has nothing to do with showing your faith to God. Um, it has everything to do with your faith being profitable to other people, showing your faith to other men. And you know, we see all the ages of Abraham through Genesis to show that he 
in Romans 4 was justified before God in uncircumcision, which was many decades before he offered Isaac his son upon the altar. So James 2 is not showing us that works is an evidence of faith. 